Hey, I'm curious. How many of you actually read the warning labels on products that you buy? Think about that. Uh, like medications and such. We have doctors among us. How many of you would say, generally, yeah, I read, I read, I read the warning, I read the, the details. Okay. If you know Stacy and, and, and me, uh, so you can imagine. So Stacy like reads every, all of them, which is probably likely in part why I'm like, oh, I don't need to read them, right? But how many know, like on, so Nitol is a sleep aid. On the bottle, the warning says, may cause drowsiness. <laughs> like, I hope so, right? And that's why I don't read, that's why I don't read this. You know the sun shades that you can put in your, on the dashboard? The warning is, don't have in place while driving. <laughs> now, I know it's hot out there, but don't, you don't do that. Who does this? There's a hair dryer, I saw this, true story. Do not use while sleeping. <laughs> I was gonna, of course I don't have a hair dryer, but I don't need, I don't. There's an, okay, on an iron, a warning label, do not iron clothes on body. <laughs> now you might try that once, right? Okay, this is real, on a tractor, there's a warning label, explicit warning. Avoid death. Like, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm trying to do that like all the time. I'm trying to do that. How many of you know that on a package of Q-tips, it says, do not put swabs in ears? How many have ever done this? Like, I thought that's what they're for. See, so I'm like, I don't need to read warnings because I, you know, I, they're for someone else, right? We often think that warnings are for someone else. And often we approach scripture that way. And today we're going to look at one of the most challenging passages in all of scripture. We've noted that the book of Hebrews has at least five, depending on who you talk to, seven um, explicit warnings in the book. And we come to one today that is the most serious. And it really sums up kind of all the warnings along the way, but... This one is very difficult. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5. You're going to need your Bible, by the way, all the time here. Bring your Bible every week. But you're going to need to open your Bible and turn to Hebrews 5. A lot of ground we're going to cover and we're going to do so. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the first point, which is a warning. The warning, really, to explain it. And we're all going to come humbly before the Lord in this text. We do so all the time. I, I must come humbly here. This is a hard passage. We've said Hebrews is a really hard book to preach because we're constantly going back, kind of, um, you know, excursus uh, or appendices to say, here's what he's talking about. Remember, these are Hebrews. They know what he's talking about. We're the ones who need help. So he just dives in to all kinds of Old Testament analogies. Um, the paradigmatic one is the, um, the salvation of God's people out, you know, through the Red Sea and in the Promised Land. He keeps on going back to that one. And we'll see it. He does it again here today. But remember, these are Jewish Christians, okay? We might call them uh, completed Jews, Messianic Jews in our day. Hebrews was the term, the label that stuck. And this is who they are. They understand the Old Testament, the Torah, the story of salvation out of, you know, the Exodus, the first story of, of their salvation. This, they live in a pluralistic society um, and likely Rome, we think, because it seems to be this global pluralistic culture and they are ha finding it harder and harder to find stability in their faith, in their lives. Now that they've committed their lives to Christ, they're formerly Jews, now believers, followers of Jesus. Their main temptation is, under persecution, is to go back to what they've always known. We all do that, don't we? They're going back. They want to go back to Judaism, back to the law. And he keeps saying, no, 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 don't go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. Jesus is the better, better high priest. If you were with us last week, he, no, he's better than anything that you formerly have known. And he's worth it all. Don't give up. And this is the heart of the message today. Their great temptation living in a pluralistic society was to say, you know, it's getting harder and harder to be explicitly Christian and to hold fast to the gospel and this is where we are today. Now, not being persecuted as they were. 
But we see this trajectory even in our culture, what Stanley Hauerwas, theologian, calls, he calls us resident aliens in a book, resident aliens living in a Christian colony. That's not to say we're hiding out, but we live sent then into the world. But we are a people who are what Scott McKnight calls dissident disciples. It's the entire story of Revelation. We are exiles, friends, living in Babylon. And we see this more and more in our culture. A pluralistic culture that has placed truth on the shelf where we don't even know what a woman is anymore. Don't get me started. What world are we living in? And so to hold fast to truth, and there's many examples, that just shows you one crazy, how absurd it is to say there is no absolute truth, and that's where it all goes, right? But this is the famous passage on apostasy, capital A, apostasy. I spent innumerable hours on this passage with Travis and Rolando and others on our team who just wanted to geek out with me and let's dive in. Uh, and talk about this, looking at the language and the original hearers and what they would have understood historically. This is a difficult passage. But the challenge is for us today is to persevere. And you're going to be given a challenge to persevere and do not give up. But I'm going to ask us to come humbly to the text. Let it speak to us. Let it speak to your heart. I'm going to ask, I'm going to challenge us not to bring our preconceived ideas to the text knowing that that really is impossible. But I want you to come humbly, let the scripture speak, because the writer will say, be warned, be encouraged, and be assured. I want to spend a lot of time, because it's mostly the text, on this first point, be warned. He wants to tell them, he's telling us, they cannot find rest or security in Jesus, because, anywhere but Jesus, because he's the new and higher, better high priest we talked about last week. So he says this in verse 11, about this we have much to say. Okay, all of that previously. And it's hard to explain. He says, here's one reason why. Since you have become dull of hearing. Now let me say this, if I'm true to the text, this, you're going to feel a bit uncomfortable along the way. And if we have some tension in the soul, in this first point in particular, then I've done my job. I love you. I love you. But this is going to be difficult. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Now listen, we can pause here for a moment. Some of you ought to be teachers. Some of you should be discipling others, not sitting in a class. Some of you ought to be in our preschool ministry, our kids' ministry, our children's ministry, our student ministry. Some of you should be teaching others, and you're not. And he goes on. Always towards application here. Lord, speak to my heart. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled. Look at this. Unskilled in the word of righteousness. Okay, this is the gospel. Christ's righteousness covering us since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. Watch how he qualifies this. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The mature are able to discern what is right and what is wrong. Friends, how desperate are we for that in our day? Mature believers... To help train up the next generation, one another. And if you have children today, if you have young people, if you have grandchildren, if you know others, you're pouring into the next generation. This is paramount as we live in this secular age. And again, the trajectory we're on. Look at verse 6. Now it starts to get murky. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Even there. Wait, what? You can't get deeper than the gospel. How is Christ elemental, rudimentary? Well, he'll explain a bit. Go on to maturity. Not laying again on the, uh, uh, a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now you say, wait, that's not 
foundational and of instruction about washings. By the way, the word there is, is plural. It's the only place we find it. The plural word for baptisms. Baptismo. So why is it translated instructions about washings? The laying of, on of hands. The resurrection of the dead. And eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Okay, now listen to this. The message, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase helps us here. I think he's spot on. Watch this. So come on, let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises of Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths are in place. Turning your back on the salvation by self-help and turning in trust toward God. Baptismal instructions, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, God helping us. We'll stay true to all that. But there's so much more. Let's get on with it. I love that. I think this is what he's saying. Now some have sought to soften the blow with what comes next. Because we're about to dive into the most challenging part of this text. Some I think have sought, have sought to soften the blow by saying none of those things that he lists here are explicitly Christian. And what the argument is, is, you know, the Jews believed in, that Abraham was justified by faith. The, the Jews believed in ceremonial washings, the mikvah, a predecessor of our baptism, and all kinds of ritual washings. The laying on of hands for consecration, we see that in the Old Testament. The resurrection of the dead, the Pharisees taught that. And eternal judgment for the unrighteous. Some would say, he's, talk, he's not talking, he's talking to Jews. He's saying, don't go back to Judaism. I disagree. And we'll see why. And I'm not the only one who does. The list is explicitly Christian. Which is why this text is very challenging. Hang on to your Bible. Look at verse 4. For it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. It's impossible. Not unlikely, not improbable. It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened. Listen to this language. Who have tasted the heavenly gift. What is that? It's the gospel. And have shared in the Holy Spirit. Have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. And then have fallen away. It's impossible. To restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. What is up with this passage? They've once enlightened. They've seen the light. This is often used as, a, as, as a, an idiom for, for salvation. They've tasted Salvation. They, they've experienced the Holy Spirit. They understand the Word of God, the promises of eternal life to come. Then have fallen away. This is apostasy. This is big A apostasy. What do we do with this passage? He said it's impossible for them to return. Now, if you're thinking with me, and I hope you are, you're already thinking about yourself. Or someone else. Am I saved? Are they saved? It's important to note here that he is addressing believers. It's like any book in the, in the New Testament, really. You know, any of the epistles. He's speaking to the gathering. But I would, I would nuance this along the way. As I would today in a crowd this size. I'm speaking to those who are believers and those who are not. And only God knows. I'm speaking to those perhaps who maybe you came to Christ many years ago, baptized, church member, thinking you came to Christ many years, you're not a believer. You're not, you're not saved. Now there's a lot here. We approach it with humility. Let's start by addressing two phrases that I don't think this passage is talking about. 
that we often use. The first one is losing one's salvation. I get this question often. Can someone lose their salvation? Now think about this for a moment. If you understand salvation, it is this. We preach it all the time. We are saved by grace, one-way love, through faith in what Christ has accomplished for us. We bring nothing to the table. We often say, it is one-way love. The only thing you bring to the table in regard to your salvation is your sin that makes it necessary. Listen to how self-centered even the question is. Can I lose my salvation? It's a ridiculous question. Understanding salvation. No, you cannot lose your salvation. Because you can't lose something you didn't gain. You did nothing for it. You can't lose it. Like you're going to misplace your keys today. But the question might be, if you're tracking with me here, you might be thinking, but can I lose? Okay, I get that, Jeff. I'm with you. I hear that all. You preach that all the time. We preach that here. It's not me. I do, I do nothing. It's by faith. But sometimes I feel like my faith is so small. Can I, can I lose my faith? Now we're getting closer to what I think this text is saying. Is it possible to lose my faith in, again, always back to the paradigmatic example of those who didn't enter into the promised land? It's what he's been talking about all this time. Why did they not enter? Well, because they didn't keep the law. No, because they weren't good enough. Well, he gave them some rules. Um, they didn't follow. They did the Ten Commandments. They didn't... No, why did they not enter in? Anybody? Lack of faith. Unbelief. Not trusting in the promises of God. That's why they didn't enter in. That's the example he continues to use. But, but listen, this is so self -tent. Can I lose my salvation? He's talking about apostasy. Let's keep pressing on. Apostasy, by the way, that the word, and there is a word in the Greek, in this famous passage on apostasy. It's not, the word's not in this passage. The word, what he says is they, when they drift away, it means to slip away. It's to get off path. It's a willful and defined decision that you are not going to follow Jesus anymore. You're leaving him behind. It's a decision to leave the path of Christ. That's apostasy. The second idea that I don't think is in this verse is once saved, always saved. This is one of those expressions I wish that we could erase from our collective theological memories. Now I'm really making you nervous. And I want to say, I want to, I want to argue, let's don't say this anymore. Because it's used, it, it is abused as a license for sin. And we do it all the time. With people we love. This is a challenging sermon. Uh, they accepted Christ when they were, like, they were little. I mean, as kids, they, I know they came to Christ. They were baptized. And they showed no sign of desiring Christ or growing him in Him at all. We find that nowhere in Scripture. In regard to those who are saved... You're thinking, but I thought you couldn't lose your salvation. Okay, this is not once saved, always saved. The key idea here is this. Perseverance. This is what he's talking about. Perseverance. Which is not once saved, always saved. How about this? All believers maintain their faith until the end. Let's replace it with this. Once truly saved, you will persevere to the end. There will be proof that you're saved because you will persevere. There's no such thing as someone who rejects Christ, refuses to commune with Him, has no desire to be in His Word, not to be with His saints, Denies the efficacy of Christ once and for all. 
sacrifice for us, his death and resurrection, and then gets to enjoy eternal life. That's not in Scripture. You will not find it. Those who will believe will persevere because they are saved. Now, this gets into, under this big umbrella of the Calvinist-Arminian debate, predestination, free will. And it's a mystery. It truly is. There's passages of Scripture that seem to represent both. So there's something going on in the economy of God. But what this, these warning passages are, are about is challenging us with the common notion I was saved 30 years ago. I was baptized, so I'm good. I got my ticket to heaven. I'm in. Again, the Bible does not teach that. He says, when we turn away, no longer believe on this trajectory, we are rejecting the gospel of free grace. And he says, there is no repentance. Another way to say that is, you reject the once and for all sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. You will find salvation nowhere else. There's nowhere else to go. You reject that, you're gone. You're out. This is apostasy. Then what's the warning? Apostasy is real. Capital A apostasy is real. But watch this. No one. I don't think anyone wakes up one day and says, I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. It's a slow fade. A drifting away. It's why it's it's called, he says, slip away, drift away, go off the path. Think about this. This will help you. David committed apostasy. Peter committed apostasy. Lowercase a. Can I say it? You and I commit apostasy often. Anytime we turn away from the Lord, small a apostasy, and what the writer is saying to us here, small a, lowercase apostasy, lead to capital A, apostasy. You will not turn back. And friends, again, let's not think this warning is for someone else. Look at verse 7. So what I've said thus far, I think the analogy, following analogy now confirms this position. And if, even still, you're confused. Hang on. Look at verse 7. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who, for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, It is worthless and near to being cursed. And its end is to be burned. Does this sound like another passage of Scripture? The parable of the sowers in Matthew 14, where Jesus talks about the different types of soil. He talks about one that falls on the rocky path. How about that? Off the path. And he says when to... He goes on to explain this parable, by the way, in in Matthew 14. He says... That the seed that falls on the rocky path are those who hear the word and receive it joyfully. But when persecution and temptation come, they turn away. And you're thinking, I thought this was going to be an encouraging message. And now I'm more concerned, more troubled than before I came in here. Be warned. But watch this. Be encouraged. The writer shifts his tone because, look at this, it's only a warning if you can do something about it. Verse 9. Though we speak in this way, in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. And I love this phrase, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust uh, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown For his name in serving the saints as you still do. He's saying as I could today with our congregation. You know you've shown that you're all in. You've proven that you continue to love the Lord. And again you all continue to bless one another and serve each other. These are signs. And we desire each one of you. 
Okay, so now to the, to the individual. To show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So that, he's, he's now he's saying, okay, watch out, I'm, I'm seeing it. Some of you are sluggish. You may not be sluggish, but, but be imitators of those who have, okay, through faith and patience, those who inherit the promise. He's saying you've proven that you have faith. Keep on following after those who are faithful, serving one another. Stay in. Don't be sluggish. And then he's going to offer examples of those who have persevered. In chapter 11, the hall of faith, which you could also call, by the way, the hall of failures. He says, look to them because they persevered till the end. When under pressure, friends, you know this. The lines of our faith are drawn. And you prove where your trust is found. This is what he's talking about here. Jesus warned us in Luke 14. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cross is not simply a nice gold piece of jewelry. The cross, you know this, is a symbol. It's an idiom in this challenge. It is a symbol of torture and death. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, it'll be the way of self-denial. It'll be the way of the cross. Dying to self. It'll be the way of enemy love. Serving others sacrificially. As you live that way, persevere. Is what he's saying. So we love encouragement. But what we need is security. Be warned. Be encouraged. Watch this. Be assured. He shifts back to the high priest of Jesus. Moving beyond the milk and to the meat of Jesus, our high priest. Look at verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear. Right? He swore by himself. Saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. For thus Abraham, having waited patiently, he waited, obtained the promise. So you know this. How would the promise come? He's not going to have a child. Then through Isaac, ultimately, after he waited, persevered, Isaac comes. Ultimately, through Christ, the promise comes. You're going to bless the nations. Through you, I'm going to bless the nations. And he says... He says that there's this promise. Now watch this. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath. Watch this. Promise and oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, promise and oath, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. You read about it in our dwell reading. Into the holy of holies where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Having become a high priest forever. Eternal high priest after the order of Melchizedek. His purpose and his oath. These two unchangeable things. God cannot lie. He will always come through on his promise. Watch this. Here's what he's saying. The entire guarantee rests on God, not on Abraham. This is what he's saying to us. This is true assurance. Placing your life trusting in Jesus and repenting of the dead works that he talks about at the beginning of this chapter. The more we think we add anything to our salvation, the less assurance we have. Think about that. Add any mix of our sinful selves, our instability to the equation makes the entire thing unstable. Instead, he's saying, Jesus is the perfect high priest. We place all of our trust in him. Friends, what do we do with this? You may be living in small a apostasy right now. And the Lord is calling you back to himself. And if you persevere and if you trust in him, you will have eternal life. 
Two examples we could run with for a while and we won't. Peter denied his Lord, he came back, and oh, did he. Judas denied his Savior as well, never came back. Is there hope for us? Can I come back to him? Yes, you can. And today is your day. Don't miss this. He's the one who perseveres in us. That's why Jesus says in Philippians 1, 6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He will finish what he starts. Why? Because his promises are true. This is why we're always growing in him. If you turn away from salvation by Christ alone, you will never repent because there's nothing to repent to. You cannot find salvation outside of him. The perseverance of the saints, think about this, is ultimately grounded in the perseverance of God, not us. How about this? Christ in us will help us to persevere today. Paul says, the saying is trustworthy in 2 Timothy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And he'll go on in, in Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. And friends, if you do not have this steadfast anchor of the soul, which is Jesus Christ, you can settle that today. Now, some of you, can you remember the day you were saved? Now, here's the truth. Some, it's such a mystery. I know some people, I believe there's a moment in time where we're saved. But I know people who say, I'm not real sure. I don't know if it was there when I was. And yet, they, listen, if that's you, but you know you're saved, praise Him. But if you can't settle that and you're not sure, you need to settle that today. More important than any lunch plans you have or anything else that's going on after this service, we'd like to meet with you and pray with you. I want to meet with you, pray with you. You can settle this. This, is, this warning is not one to be messed with. And, and I just want to encourage you, friends. I don't want anyone to leave this message and to drift off into capital A apostasy, never to return. What can you do about this? I believe the Spirit speaking to you. But I will say this, I think two things. I talk to people all the time who doubt their salvation and a primary reason that they do is because they've never been baptized. That is no small thing. If you've never been baptized, I challenge you to come forth if you have received Christ so that you can proclaim to the world, to him and everyone else that you believe in him. The other thing I've noted earlier, when we drift away like a coal that's taken away from the fire, it'll go out. If you're not a member of the local church, I challenge you to join our church today. Don't play games. Stop dating the church. Join the church today and it just might save you from an eternity apart from him. Not that that is salvific, but it will keep you in the game and you will grow to understand what Jesus has done for you. And you will persevere 